I'm still saved, that I'm on my way to heaven, not looking for a new group to join, ain't looking for a cult to carry me away. I'm, I'm hooked up with the group I want to be hooked up with, and I believe the Lord's going to come and get us one day. And so tonight I'm just going to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And every Christian, this ought to be your favorite subject. You ought to be in love with Jesus. And just love Him supreme. Ninety percent of the problems in every church would be solved just like that if everybody would fall in love with Jesus. A lot of times we're trying to preach a devil out of everybody, and we have to do that. But uh, most of the time, most people's problems be solved if they'd love Jesus like they ought to. See, if you love Him like you ought to, you'll stay out of the places you ought to stay out of. You'll go where you ought to go, do what you ought to do if you love Him because you don't want to hurt Him. And so tonight I want to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. We break in on the story here, the woman at the well, and most of you know this story very good, and so I'll not take time to read of it. Here's a woman who came to draw water at the well and left her water pot and took the well home with her. She took a well inside of her that's springing up into everlasting life. That's right. And I'm glad that you can do that too. When you get saved, you leave your water pot, whatever you wasn't doing, and you get a well of water springing up in you in everlasting life. John chapter 4, and let's look at verse number 14. I'll not uh, read the first part. Most of you know it. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. I mean, he got right to the root of her problem. She was just a little on the immoral side, and had five husbands and shacking up with one. And the Lord said, uh, before you can get any everlasting water, honey, you're going to have to get rid of this adultery that you're living in. That's right. That's right. He didn't say, well, you make your decision to trust me right here and that's... No, you've got to deal with them sins first. You do not come to Jesus Christ without dealing with them sins first. We're living in a day when people say, all you got to do is just come and believe, come and believe, come and believe. And that's true. But you can't really believe on Him like you should until you deal with that sin question. He said, go call your husband. And she said, uh, I ain't got one. He said, you said that right. You've had five and you're shacking up with one. And look how he said in verse 19. She said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> Amen. And immediately she wants to start up a doctrinal argument. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that ye believe in once saved, always saved. And you do this and you do that. And what do you think about the Moonies? And uh, what do you think about being baptized? And, and he said, never mind that. You better get right with God. He said, ye say that in Jerusalem where place ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh. When ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, stop right there. I'm not going to preach on this. But you've got to worship. The only way you can worship God is worship Him in spirit and in truth. You have a lot of people who have all kinds of spirit and no truth. I mean, they just whoop to do hallelujah, turn and flip, jump in the pews, have us a big time, and they don't know a bit more what the Bible says than a man in the moon. They're off base. Then you've got somebody, on the other hand, that's got the truth. And we have the truth but we don't believe in getting emotional, and we don't believe in saying amen, and we just believe in being dignified. They really believe in being petrified. But see, their problem is they've got all truth and no spirit. You can't worship God without His spirit, and you can't worship God without His truth. Never forget that. Now, the Bible tells us here in the next verse, verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When He is come, He will tell us all things. 
Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. We'll take our text from verse 29 tonight. Look at it. Mark this if you will. The, the Bible said this lump woman said, Come see a man. That's what I want to preach to you tonight is come see a man. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity that we have once again to be able to bow here in Your presence and call Thee our Father. Lord, I'm glad and I'm thankful tonight that one day we saw Jesus through the eye of faith. Lord, I'm glad and I'm thankful that You reveal Yourself to us through the Word of God. I thank You tonight for my brothers and my sisters here tonight. I thank You, Lord, for people who have a hunger for the Word of God. And I know, Lord, if they're saved, and Lord, if they're right with You tonight, Lord, that they'll be able to enjoy the, the service when we talk about Jesus. Lord, there's a song sung a while ago. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is He, the Lord of all supreme throughout eternity. Lord, I'm glad, Lord, that nobody's going to take You off of the throne. Lord, I'm glad, Lord, that even though they put nails in Your hands, that they'll never put any nails in Your hands again. Lord, I know they put You on an old cross, but they'll never put You on an old cross again. Lord, I'm glad tonight, Lord, God, that You'll come as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Father, we pray that You'd help us, Lord, that we could be faithful to You unto that day. God, that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, witnessing, preaching, doing that You've called us to do. And whatever and however You do for us, we'll praise You and thank You for it. May we glorify and magnify Your blessed name tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Something wrong, Brian. Something wrong. I want to talk to you tonight by the help of the Lord on the subject, Come See a Man. The Bible tells us here that this lady made this statement. She went back to these people that she found down yonder in Samaria, and she said, Man, you've got to come and see this guy. You ain't never met nobody like him. You have got to come and meet him. He, he read my mind. He, he knows what I was doing. And he, there's just something about him. I believe he's the Messiah. Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. I want to talk to you about tonight. Come see a man. I'd like you just not to look at me tonight. I want you to let your spiritual eye go beyond this pulpit tonight and beyond McDowell County's uh, line and cut up north up past Knoxville and past Michigan and past Canada and past the North Pole and look into the new Jerusalem there tonight and see the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Him at His earthly ministry. Somebody said one time that the short years, three short years of the public ministry of Jesus Christ have done more to soften and regenerate mankind than all the moralizing of the moralizers, than all the philosophizing of the philosophers in the entire world since Time began. Just one man walked around down here on this earth for three years. I want you to know he's had more impact on the lives of men, women, boys, and girls than ever other man that's ever lived in this world. People who don't believe in Jesus, you know, I want to tell you something. They've got a hard time explaining how that 2,000 years later, there's still literally millions of people that love His name and that worship Him and will live for Him. Brother, I tell you tonight, there ain't never been a man like Jesus Christ. He was the God-man. He was God manifest in the flesh. And brother, you ought to learn that. If you go to this church and don't know that, I'm ashamed of myself. You ought to know that He was God manifested in flesh. 
You say, I thought he's, he was all God and he was all man. He wasn't half God and half man. He wasn't just a, a man a little bit higher than us. He was all God and at the same time, all man. I want us to look at him tonight. Let's look at Jesus Christ tonight. First of all, I want to say he's a physician that never lost a case. He's a physician, brother, that never lost a case. We see him here, man, you talk about a doctor. He'd put these doctors here. I mean, uh, especially these little foreigners, you know. He'd put that crowd out of business. I tell you, he is a doctor who never lost a case. Over there in the book of Matthew chapter 9, you don't have to turn these Scriptures. I'm going to give you some cases of doctrine, brother. You talk about a doctor. Now, he is a flat doctor. He never lost a case. Why, the most greatest doctor in this world right now, I bet you could go talk to him, and if he'd be honest about it, he'd say, boy, I had a cancer patient, or I had a heart attack victim, and I lost it. But if you went to the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, and you could talk about his three and a half year ministry, you'd say, did you ever lose one? Did you ever come across one you couldn't heal? Did you ever come across it too? He'd say, no, not a one. I tell you, he's a physician that never Never lost a case. I tell you what's wrong with a lot of church members. They start looking at the preacher. Or they start looking at the church. And that's where you get let down. You can look at me and see something wrong. You can look at Brother John and see something wrong. You can look at your teacher and see something wrong. But I'll guarantee you one thing. If you'll keep your eyes on Him, you'll never see nothing wrong. You'll never see nothing wrong with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 9, i, I got a new title for that I preached the other Sunday morning on bringing men to Jesus. I read it in a preacher's book, and boy, I like to shout it. You know, the, where the four men brought the one man to Jesus? I got a new title for that. Some of you preachers might want to preach on it. The title is, The Ten-Legged Man and the Quartet That Raised the Roof Off the House. Amen? I tell you, that's a, that'll a preach, won't it? I tell you, brother, that was a ten-legged man. He is laying there, four men brought him to Jesus, and a quartet raised the roof off the house, and the Lord looked down, and that old boy had a, the palsy. I mean, he was just all crippled up here, and he couldn't even walk. And he, he just limbs was drawn in, and the Lord said, uh, well, what kind of case we got here? And they said, Dr. Jesus, this man's got the palsy. You think you can help him? You think there's anything to be done? And he said, well, I forgive his sins. And they said, now, now we know, I don't, we don't want to hear that. What can you do? And the Lord said, Get up! And brother, that old boy got up. He never gave him a shot, never gave him no uh, ether, or never gave him no anesthetic. And he just got up and walked out. He's a doctor and a physician that never lost a case. He put one time something his finger in some boy's ears that couldn't hear, and they went away seeing. You know what they do with deaf people now? They put them down yonder in a place of confinement. No doctor can help them. But the Lord, brother, he just said, be open. And their ears were open. I seen him one time when he clear, uh, cleansed leprosy. In Luke 17, verse 11, there were ten lepers. Leprosy, no known cure for it. There's still lepers in the world tonight, and there is no known cure for leprosy in this world. There ain't a doctor in this world that you can take a patient and say, this man got leprosy, and him give him some medicine. And to it. He just can't do it. But there's ten of them come to the Lord. At one time, ten of them. You see, if it had just been one, somebody said, oh, they paid that man to do that. And he's a fake, you know, and it wasn't really real. But there's ten of them at one whack. And boy, they come up, and I mean, their lips was about gone. Their eyebrows were gone. They didn't have them but about four or five hairs sticking out of their head. And boy, they were, uh, they, I had a receding hairline. I, some of you look like you might be getting leprosy. But anyway, brother, they, they had a, they didn't have about four or five hairs sticking out of their head. And I mean, brother, their fingernails would rot off. And I mean, their little gums and their teeth would just rot, just fall away to nothing. And boy, they all come tend to him. And the Lord said, 
Go! And all of a sudden, all ten of them just got clean and their flesh became as a little child. Then I see him in Luke 6 and verse 10 where there's a man that had a withered hand and it was all he couldn't control it. And boy, they, doc, they brought him to the doctor. They brought him to the physician. I tell you, brother, he put the other physicians out of business when he was here. I bet you there's some of them doctors in Jerusalem that never did. One was so happy when he got gone because business picked back up when Jesus, after the Lord, went back to heaven. I bet you some of them about had to file bankruptcy while he was here. He'd go into the whole town, man, and clear out the whole sick crowd. Now that's what you call a healer. I ain't like these fakes going running around today. That's, that was a healer, brother. He didn't have a dud one. These healers nowadays have duds. They, they get one or two healed and then come over healed and he don't get healed. And they say, well, you didn't have enough faith. No, you're just a liar. Amen. The Lord never did have a dud. He didn't have no duds. You, uh, these healers, let me tell you something about these healers. I hate to ruin a good message by talking about that sorry outfit. But I want to tell you what they do. They have a big line up here and they say, you get healed, you get healed, you get healed. All right, if a man supposedly gets healed, who gets the credit? The healer. If the man don't get healed, who gets the blame? The poor fella standing in line. There ain't no way that sorry thing can look bad. I mean, if they get healed, he gets the glory. And if they don't, the other person gets the blame. And he says, well, you just didn't have enough faith, dear brother. You come back next year and go home and suffer for a while. And if you be real good, Lord might heal you next time. I want you to know the Lord didn't pay no attention whether they had any faith or not. You say, they had to have faith. Hey, Smarty, what about them dead people? They didn't have no faith. Ain't that right? Listen, he never did come on a dud. He'd go in the hospital and clean the whole thing out. Everybody get up and go home. That's right. I'll tell you what. Now, he walk in there in the hospital, he'd clean the whole thing out. I mean the whole thing. Everybody in there, get up and go home. He's a physician that never lost a case. Now, not only that, but we see him heal that man's withered hand just immediately. And you say, well, I know. what about sick and the fever? In Luke chapter 4 and verse 38, Peter's wife's mother, my soul, Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. If Peter had been like most Baptist preachers, he'd have just said, let her die. But he said, well, Lord, come and heal her. And so the Lord come. And Peter's wife, mother-in-law had a terrible fever. And brother, the Lord come to her. That shows you that Peter wasn't no pope. He wasn't no pope. Never. You know what's the matter with the pope? He's too pooped the pope, brother. That's what's wrong. Peter was not a pope. He was not a pope. There's no such thing in the Bible. And brother old Peter, he had a sick mother-in-law, and the Lord come and raised her up just immediately on the spot. You say, I ain't used to hearing nobody talk like that. You just ain't used to hearing preaching. That's what you need to go. You need to go to church once in a while and let somebody preach to you. Do you good. You'd be surprised how much good it do you. He's a physician that never lost a case. You say, Brother Danny, what if they got worse than that? I read about a blind man in John chapter 9. I mean, he couldn't see a thing. I mean, he'd trip over things. He could not see anything. The Bible said in John chapter 9, he was born blind. And brother, he wasn't just one of these uh, three-fourths of the way people or had wear great big thick glasses, you know. I mean, he, son, he couldn't see his hand like in the dark or in the sunshine. He couldn't see the sun, brother. He's blind as a bat. And he, he didn't have any sight. And the Lord came to him. And he said, you know, had a conversation with him. And the Lord touched him, and he healed his eyes. And the Pharisees, they got mad. And they got jealous. And they said, you ain't supposed to do that. And they got this old boy over here, and he's just looking around, looking around. And they said, quick to his parents. And they said, is, is that your son over there? And they said, yeah. And he said, was he really born blind? And they said, yeah. And he said, that Pharisee said, well, how in the world did he get his sight back? And the parents said, uh, 
I don't know. He's old enough. Ask him. They said, he is our son, and he, he was blind. But how he can see now, we don't know. And I don't know what happened to that boy. He went down there with that bunch of fanatics where they meet and sing and preach. And I tell you, he's been different ever since. I used to couldn't get him to do nothing. He wouldn't mind. He would take out the trash. But ever since he went down there with that crowd, he's just a different person. And go ask him. And boy, they went over and asked that little old boy. They said, how'd you get your sight? He said, a man. That is called Jesus. No, no, uh, t- touch me. And now I can see. And they said, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. We, we caught him doing this. And we caught him breaking the law. And that old boy stood up and preached one of the best sermons I ever heard. He stood up and said, now wait a minute, you fellas right here now. You keep all your accusations to yourself. You keep all your criticism. He said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I once was born blind, and now I see. And thank God tonight we can say that when the old world goes to accusing our Bible and making fun of the old time religion, we can look back at them and say, I tell you, I don't know about all that stuff you're talking about, but one thing I know, I once was blind, but thank God now I see. He's a physician that never lost the case. But not only that tonight, we see him raising a dead man. That's a pretty bad sickness. I ain't never heard of nobody having one worse than that. I mean, a dead person. In John chapter 11, uh, brother, Lazarus died. And Jesus, he'd been dead four days and stunk like a horse. And he's in the tomb. And boy, the Lord went over there. And you know the story how he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was bound in grave clothes got up. And he come walking out of there stunk. Looked like a mummy, man. Come walking out of there. Had that stuff wrapped all around him. And he said, loose him and let him go. In Luke chapter number nine, or, or in Luke chapter number seven and verse eleven, there's an old boy died, and there's a having his funeral. That's right, boy. I mean, there's going down. They had the, the camels, the wagons all lined up, headlights on, and the coffin right in front of it. It's going to the graveyard, man. Put him under. Somebody said, who's going to preach this funeral? And here come the preacher. And boy, when the preacher got there, he walked over and touched the bear. B-I-B-E-I-R. That's a, that's a, that's a little holder or stamp for the coffin. And that boy was laying there dead, and he went over and touched that little holder and said, Son, get up! And boy, he sat up in that coffin, and them people... My God, what's the matter? Like to scare the daylights out of them? They went, Ow! I mean, a dead man got up and he said, Hi, oh, Mama, I'm starving to death. Let's go by heart. He's on the way home and have us a big time. And he got up, brother, and went back home. You think about that. That old undertaker said, Hmm. And the next meeting they had, I guess McCall was a living back then. I don't know. I shouldn't have said that. It, well, I, whatever the Westmoreland, whatever the name of their funeral home was, I bet you they got in there and had a meeting and said, Boys, there's a little problem here in the community. There's this one certain preacher that's been a preaching these funerals. And if he don't quit, we're going bankrupt. They said, we get the down payment on the coffin, and before we can ever put them in the hole, they done, this feller done raised them from a dead, and we have to give them a refund because they're a family that goes back home. What in the world are we going to do? Is it, is it hard for you to figure out how come the whole world turned on him? He hit them right there. Right in the old pocketbook, brother. I t- that's why we've had so much trouble in the last two weeks. You know what? We hit them right there, boy, in the old pocketbook. And you start messing with that thing right there, you're going to catch it. You know it? That's why the doctors want him crucified. That's why the lawyers want him crucified. He got rid of their business, brother. People got saved and got straightened out. Quit going to them lawyers. Well, funeral director said... Uh, don't get him to preach any more funerals. He's a little bit fanatical. 
food truth was he's putting us out of business. Well, let me say right quickly tonight, a lot of things I want to say. Not only is he a physician who never lost a case, but he's a captain who never lost a battle. I tell you, he grew up on so many battles. And the Bible says he's the captain of our salvation. Not we've already saw him come up against disease, and the enemy came up, and the Lord said, I'll stand against you. And the captain won the battle. We not only see him win over disease, but we see him win over demons. In, in the book of Luke, chapter number 9 and verse 38, there's a little old boy that had demons. And I mean, this boy was demon-possessed. And all that stuff that they have on the exorcist and all that, they're just playing. That's just little kitty stuff for the kitties, you know. And the demons really do get in them. But there are people who are actually really honest to goodnessly demon possessed. And the demons got in this boy, and he'd just be walking along, and all of a sudden, it'd throw him over in the fire. And it'd throw him down. And he'd throw him at the mouth. And just, he'd be acting normal. All of a sudden, ah, just go crazy. And the, the, the Bible says that he had demons in it. Now, there is a difference in the Bible between demon possession and a mental disorder. Don't ever think that anybody who's just a little bit mentally off is demon possessed, cause they're not. I, I show you that in the Bible, where the Bible said they were, uh, the, some of them were derelicts and lunatics, and then some of them had demons. Some of them just crazy. I mean, sometimes a person just be crazy. That's all they are to it. That, that don't mean they're demon possessed. Just like somebody got something on their foot, somebody else got something on their hand, somebody else got something on their ear, some people got something on their brain. That don't mean that they're demon possessed. Just cause a person got something on their hand don't mean they're demon possessed. Just cause a person got something on their brain don't mean they're demon possessed. Now there's a difference between being lunatic and being demon possessed and just sick in the Bible. So this old boy, he had demons. And the disciples said, Get out! And they couldn't cast him out. And the Lord said, bring him over here. And they said, Lord, us soldiers, we can't do him. So we'll bring him to the captain. And the captain stood up. And the captain said, what's the problem? And they said, well, there's this boy got demons, and we, the soldiers, cannot cast him out. And the captain said, bring him over here. And he looked at his disciples, and he said, how long shall I suffer you? How long, so faithless, faithless generation... He said, this kind, you can't get this kind out but by prayer and fasting. And it does say in fasting. The Bible said those, I mean, these marginal notes say the best manuscripts omit and fasting. But the reason for that is, is because the people who mess with the best manuscripts don't like to miss dinner. And brother, they, it does say, and fasting. Prayer and fasting. And the Lord said, you this kind you don't get out, but by prayer and fasting. And so he said, come here. And he went, Get! And boy, that demon, when he heard that boy, Get! went out of that boy, and that old boy jerked around there a little bit, and the captain had won a battle. He's a captain who never lost a battle. I remember one time he went into a certain city in the Word of God, and the Bible said there's a man there whose name was Legion. And the reason his name was Legion is because that old boy had 2,000 demons inside of him. Boy, that's bad, you know it. Somebody said that the devil usually sends somebody to every church sent by the devil to mess up a church. And I guess that's true. I guess he'd send a lot here if we he could. We'll keep, you know, praying and do what we're supposed to. The Lord will take care of us. This old boy had so many demons in him. Man, he's, I mean, he's full up to his ears with demons. And they come out to him. He said, my name is Legion. Now the demons immediately recognized that Jesus was somebody special. They said, uh-oh. 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 Boys, we've been playing with these soldiers the last few years. Here come the captain. And more when the captain come... He didn't have to say, I command you, you know, shake them, you know, and beat them around the bush, you know, and read them three or four books and stuff like that. They spoke first. They said, 
What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus, Son of God, thou torment us not before our time. Don't cast us into hell. No! No! And the Lord said, Get! And when he said, Get! They went out of them people. They went out of that man. And the Bible said there's a big old herd of hogs, swine, feeding on the side of the hill. There are 2,000 hogs. They just mind their own business. Just doing just what a hog's supposed to do. <coughs> Rooting around, snunting around, trying to find them something to eat. Just being just a hog. 2,000 demons came out of that man and went in 2,000 hogs. Now, I don't know if it's exactly that number. Maybe it's just enough to get them stirred up. I don't know. But anyway, 2,000 hogs all of a sudden. <coughs> and them demons got in there went. And turned around and ran violently down a steep place. They did. Ran down a big steep bank and just went down through there and just went, whoo, done a gator and turned off in the water and committed hogicide. That's right. Ain't that what the Bible said? Is that what your Bible said? They, I mean, they killed herself, man. That's the first case in the Bible of devil ham right there. They got in, brother, they got in them hogs, and they went down to that. You know what? I preach this all over the country. You know what a farmer said one time? He said, you can't make a hog run downhill. Hog won't run downhill. No matter which way you chase a hog, he'll always turn and run up a hill. But when them hogs got them demons in them, boy, they started acting like a lot of church people I've seen. They started acting contrary. They started act griping and grumbling and doing what they wasn't supposed to do. And boy, them demons got in them hogs and they went down in there and the hogs drowned. You say, did them demons drown? Sure not. They sure they didn't drown. No, demons didn't drown. They went underneath that water, come up over and stuck up a sign and said, the church of Christ meets here. And the baptism say, and went on down the road trying to find them some converts. I'm here to tell you tonight, the captain never lost a battle. I tell you, y'all a little slow getting in here now. Let's go. you got to keep up with me. He's a captain who never lost a battle. But not only that, brother, he never lost a battle with disbelievers. Old Thomas, he doubted a little bit. And I don't guess we ought to get on as much as we do. He probably had more faith than most of us. And old Thomas, boy, he said, I ain't going to believe unless I see him and put my hand in his side. And the Lord had a little battle and one day. And the captain came in. He said, what was that you were saying, Thomas? He said, my Lord and my God. He didn't have to put his hand in his side. He didn't have to touch him. He said, never mind, Lord. I believe. Lost a battle with dissenters, people who wanted to argue. They wanted to come and argue with him all the time. He never did lose a battle. They'd get old Peter, James, and John out there and trip them up. And they'd say, well, what about this? What about that? How do you know Moses, what Moses wrote? You don't have the original Hebrew. That, 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 that. You ain't been to seminary. This, this. You don't need, how do you know this? How do you know that? And old Peter and James and John, they'd come back and say, man, I'm confused. But one day the captain came and the captain came, they started that junk on him. And buddy, they couldn't pull none of that old that old junk on him. You see, first of all, the Pharisees came. And boy, they said, we'll get him. And the Lord asked them, he said, uh, he said, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. They said, what is it? He caught them off guard. He said, the baptism of John. Was it of God or was it of the devil? Them Pharisees, they looked around here for a minute and they said, Come here, let's huddle. Listen, if we say it was of God, he's going to say, Well, why didn't you believe it? And they said, If we say it's of the devil, then everybody's going to get mad at us because they all believed in John. So they scratched their head for a minute and come back to him and they said, we cannot tell. And the Lord said, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. And it wasn't just a minute until the Sadducees come. 
Now the Sadducees did not believe in what? Resurrection. They believed this life was all there was, and there wasn't no resurrection. That's why they called them the sad, you see. They were sad. If, we, if in this life only we have most, we are all men most sad. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're sad, you see. So the Sadducees come to him. And they start running their mouth. And they said, Master. Watch out for these people that call him Master. That's what Judas Iscariot always called. Did you ever notice that Judas never did call him Lord? Did you pick that up when you were reading? Did you ever read what Jesus said Judas was a devil? Oh yeah! Watch out for that crowd that calls him Master. Now he is our Master, but just watch out for that crowd that won't call him Lord. So they came to him and they said, Master, you're a great man of God. We need you to answer us a question. Now you know that in our denomination we don't believe in the resurrection. And here's why. The Lord said, Say on. And they said, Moses commanded, if a man die, that his brother take his wife and raise up seed to his brother. Now there were among us a man who had a wife and seven brethren. And it came to pass that the man died, and his brother married her. And it came to pass he died, and his other brother married her. And it came to pass he died. And his other brother married him. And it came to pass, he died. And I, that poor woman. Seven brothers, brother. Can you imagine? You ladies, I know if your husband died, you'd never marry his brother. The Lord, he's anything like him. I want to get a brand new family. Seven boys. She married of the, all of them brothers. Poor soul. Didn't have a chance. Didn't have a choice. I don't know, she might have poisoned them. <laughs> She's like, oh, that, guy, that old woman that come to Billy Kelly one time, she said, boy, you're a mean preacher. She said, if you was my husband, I'd put poison in your food. He said, if you was my wife, I'd eat it. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. She might have poisoned them, I don't know. But anyway, seven men died. And they said, and last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife shall she be? For they all had her. And boy, they thought they had him. They kind of punched each other and sniggered. <laughs> See, he can't say they're all going to be her husband up there in heaven. A lot of people think that, you know. Uh, I heard a lady one time in a testimony meeting. She got up. And she's doing real good there for a minute. She's a real old lady. And she said, I just want to thank the Lord for saving me and all He's done for me. And she said, I just can't wait to get to heaven to see my husbands. I've got two of them up there. I, I don't know how, how what she thought, how it was going to work. But anyway, he said, all right. And they said, let's see you get out of this one, big boy. He said, you dummies don't even study a Bible and you don't know what the power of God is. You do err, not knowing the Scripture, nor the power of God. Amen. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And they, they said, well, Lord, what about them fallen angels? He said, I didn't say nothing about them fallen angels. I said, them angels in heaven don't marry or not given in marriage. He said that in Matthew. And they said, oh. And he put the Sadducees to silence. And then it wasn't but just a few minutes till somebody come up to him. And they said, boys, give me a quarter or something. Give me a penny. I ain't got, a, I ain't got nothing but a cert in my pocket. I, he come up to him and somebody had a, somebody had a penny. And they come up to him, and that's a quarter, but anyway, it'll do. They come up to him and they said, Master, shall we give tribute to Caesar? 
See, he'd been going around telling everybody they ought to love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and not worship anybody else. And they said, well, are we going to worship Caesar and pay tribute to him? And you see, that their, their trick was, if they said, now, if he says yes, we'll say, well, you done said for us to do everything for God. But if he said no, they'd say, well, you're breaking the law. And so what he said, we said, give me a penny. They said, here you go. And he looked at that thing, he said, uh, who pitchers on there? And they said, Caesar's. And the Lord said, okay, give Caesar what Caesar's. And they kind of walked off like that and he said, oh, oh, oh yeah, give God what's God's. Boy, they went out of there with under conviction. And man, they, uh, uh, they, they went out of our brother and they, they never did ask him no more questions. Amen. Us preachers got to make a living somehow, man. I want you to know tonight, brother, the captain never lost a battle. I, I heard about him talking to the old captain on the other side one time. The devil himself. And he come to him on the man of on the man of temptation, and the Lord was hungry, and his stomach was a hurting, and brother the old slugger that knocked out Adam and knocked out Cain and knocked out Seth. Here he come. I mean, boy, he said, "Come on, come on, I've got him. Come on, come on, come on. I'll get you. I'll get you." And they said, "All right, here's the showdown." And the captain of our faith, I'm glad it's him there that day, and not me, buddy. I wouldn't have been there, not eat a bite for forty days and facing Satan. Would you? No, sir. I'm glad my captain is around at times like that. And he's a captain who never lost a battle. And boy, the old devil came to him and they said, uh, You're hungry, ain't you? The Lord didn't say nothing. You better off not talk to the devil. That's where Eve got in trouble. The devil said, Boy, you ain't got a good Christian attitude. The Lord didn't speak a word. He said, if you're the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And the Lord looked back at him. See, the devil went, wow. And the Lord looked back and he went, it is written. Wow. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The boy, he hit the devil and the devil went, wow. He ain't like Noah. I got Noah drunk. He ain't like David. I got David commit adultery. He ain't like Daniel. Daniel let a heathen king worship him. He ain't like Saul, Paul. Paul got out of the will of God. Oh, he ain't been saved yet, is he? Uh, he ain't like, uh, we're still in the gospel. Paul ain't even saved yet. He ain't like Paul's gonna be. I tell you, I ain't never met no character like this. So he come back at him. He said, Let's quote a little scripture, hey? Test yourself down if you're the Son of God. Jump off this high peak of mountain. It is written over in Psalms. Don't you remember? He shall give His angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they'll bear thee up, lest they'll dash thy foot against the stone. And the Lord looked back at him, and his body was weak, and his stomach was hurting. And he come back with a left hook. And said, Go well, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> Knocked him back again. And he got here said, Got to get a hold of myself here. I've slew kings. I've got down Nebuchadnezzar. I've got down Belshazzar. Surely I can handle this Jew. He's been fasting 40 days. Oh, oh, I... I, I gotta get him. And he said, I'll get him this time. I'll get him this time. And here he come back. Third round. Bell run. Ding! And here he come out. And he's ready this time. He said, all right. All right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, hey, come on. And boy, he got down. And he said, I tell you what. Uh, I tell you what. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Wow! You'll bow down and worship me. And the Lord Jesus Christ reached back. And he ride that big right hand back again. He's going to finish him off this time. And he ride back and he said, It is written. It is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. 
and him only shalt thou serve to whom and out he went boy and the Lord knocked him out in the third round I'm glad he's a captain who never lost a battle let me say number three tonight he was a teacher who never misinformed a student I tell you, brother, I've heard a lot of teachers. I've listened to tapes and I've read books and I've taught myself. But I've never met or seen a teacher that somewhere or another maybe didn't go off a little bit. Maybe because of his own flesh or his pride or something. But here's a teacher who never misinformed a student. He told this woman here, he said, let me tell you how you worship God. You worship God in spirit and truth. He told her right, didn't he? If he'd have been a modern day Pentecostal, he'd have Sudden, all you need just a happy doodle time, sister. You just take cut flips and shout all the way home. She went, Woo! And not told her the truth. But if she'd have been a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or uh, another, you know, something like that, he'd have said, All you do is believe in me. Don't get emotional. And she'd have went home just as bad off one way as she would the other. And he said, You've got to have the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord inside of you, spring it up into everlasting life. And he said, it's not whether or not you have the Holy Ghost, but it's whether or not the Holy Ghost has you. And he said, if you'll believe on me, you'll have him. He'll be in your water, springing up into everlasting life. And he said, but you've got to get your doctrine straight too, and believe on me as the Messiah, and worship God in spirit and in truth. We see him in John chapter 3, when there's an old boy come to him, a master of the Jews, uh, uh, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he came in John chapter 3, and the Lord said, Nicodemus, how long have you been going to church? And Nicodemus said, all my life, Lord. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. I'm glad the teacher didn't misinform him. He didn't say, now here's Nicodemus. I better not be judging him because he's a ruler of the Jews. And I want to get in good with these Jews because I'm their Messiah. And I want them to believe in me. And Nicodemus went to him, he said, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And the Lord looked back and said, You must be born again. And kept on doing what he's doing. Nicodemus said, oh, Well, that's not very mannerly. What a greeting. What's this born again business? And the Lord said, Nicodemus, do you mean to tell me that you're a ruler of the Jews and you don't even know what it means to be born again. And Nicodemus said, you talking about like, like, a, like in the hospital, like a baby? And I enter in the second time and look how big I am, man. I can't be born again. Now you know what you see there? You see a religious leader that didn't have no spiritual sense. Now, I could ruin this message some more by saying some things right here, but there's a lot of religious leaders in our day that don't even know what it really means to be born again. And all they ever talk about is being positive. And you can do it. And with Amway, you can be a success. Believe in yourself. You No, that ain't what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you can't do it. You're a failure. You're a nothing. You're a nobody. All is sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Have you noticed? Have you noticed this strange brand of Christianity you got going nowadays? It, it's really scary to me. It really is. They're all ganging up on us. The liberals and. And even the bad, so they're, they're turning on the real Bible believers. I was talking about old, old Dr. Ruckman. Now that, you know one reason I know Dr. Peter Ruckman's right in a lot of ways? Because everybody's against him. If everybody's against the man, he's doing something right, brother. And it always went that way in the Bible. I mean, everybody's against you. And there's something scary going on in, in, in Christianity today. Not the magazine. Christianity today. There's something scary going on. There's this, there's this strange spirit. There's this other Jesus. There's this, 
I, I don't know how to describe it. You, it's just like this service that we're having here tonight. You can hear a la- average Christian music. They call it contemporary. When all it is 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 Christian words, and there ain't many of them Bible words. It's Christian words put to rock music. And they say the music communicates. I know good and well what that music communicates. I found that out. I played in rock bands before I got saved. I know what that music communicates. It communicates flesh and lust. So I don't agree. You're wrong. I don't know how I got off on that. Oh, yeah. Then they have this, this they talk funny. They just, they just talk funny. It sounds like they're putting on. It's, dearly beloved, we are so fortunate to be able to come into your home and share with you. I mean, and they just, they just something wrong when somebody talks like that, people. They don't talk like that. All. You think they go home and they're like, they're, them and their wife lays down and they get ready to go to bed and they say, it's such a wonderful privilege for me to be with you here tonight. They say, honey, turn that light out. I'm going to sleep. They talk like a normal person. <laughs> they live, really. I'm, there is something wrong with a preacher that when he gets up here in the pulpit, he just turns into this super duper spiritual. There's something wrong with that kind. You, listen, you know how I talk up here? I talk the same way. I try to talk the same way everywhere I go. I ain't acting. I'm doing exactly what comes natural to me right now. I ain't putting on. I ain't holding back. I'm just doing whatever comes to my mind. I'm just, I'm just flat out just having myself a time right now. Telling them about the Savior. And I tell you what, I, I, I tell you what, I'd split the church before I'd say, well, I'm going to get in a little mole here or a little mole here and I ain't going to say nothing about this and I ain't going to mention somebody like, like old Ruckman I mentioned a while ago or like somebody that somebody don't like. Just jump the lake, brother! I just want to preach the truth and have myself a time! Amen. I don't want to get into that put-on Christianity. Amen. It's put-on! It's fake! Lord knows it, too. And the Lord said, Nicodemus, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, religious leader. Come out here in a robe. You dumb looking thing, you. That dumb looking robe off. What would y'all think about me? Now really, really. What would y'all think next Sunday morning if at 11 o'clock I come out of here and I had on a white robe and I walked across here like this? God say it's finally happened. He's flipped his lid. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. Ain't no sense in that. You say, well, Jesus wore a robe. Listen, that was the common dress of his day. If he's walking in here right now, he wouldn't wear one. He'd dress like the rest of us. He dress like the common people of your day. If I come out here with a robe and sandals, that look, look ridiculous. One time I seen these guys right down here at the bottom of the hill, and I don't know what they was. They said we're some kind of children. They was hippie, dippy, hippie Christians, you know. I call them hypocrites. They still want to smoke pot and love Jesus, too. They still want the devil's music and the Lord's spirit. That don't jive, boy. You can't have both of them. Amen. You say, well, I've got the Holy Ghost. You've got the unholy ghost. Amen. The Holy Ghost don't live in a dirty house. Amen. I'll say it again. The Holy Ghost don't live in a dirty house. And these two guys standing right down there at the bottom of the hill one day. And there's a bumming around, had on robes, you know, and beard, long hair, turban, whatever, a towel around their head, sheets. And they said, we're children, we're disciples. Like as, I look like it's spaced out or something to me. <laughs> really, that's crazy. 
I said, uh, what kind of disciples are you guys? They said, we're disciples of Christ. We don't believe in working. <laughs> yeah. They're the kind, they don't believe in cars, but they'll sure let you take them in yours wherever they want to go. Mm. Now, the reason they don't believe in cars, they don't believe in working, paying for the tires and the insurance and all that other stuff. That's their problem. They're lazy, boy. And there's hippies, and they had an experience, and they said, oh, I can still be cool and love Jesus too. Like, love you, love you, love Satan, love Jesus, love everybody. Like, love, like, love is the main thing. They're off, they're off, they're off! And the way you know they're off because they fade out so quick. Well, Nicodemus, he's a teacher. I've got to hurry. He taught him many things. And he told Nicodemus, he said, now listen, Nick. Listen, listen, sonny boy. You've got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. The Lord didn't say nothing in that chapter about being baptized. Amen. Amen. See, if you make that water being baptized, you're going to say baptism is essential for salvation. Right? He said, you've got to be born of the water. What's he talking about? He said, you've got to be born again. In other words, he's talking about his first birth and his second birth. First time you're born, you're born of water. Second time you're born, you're born of spirit. That fits the context. I used to preach it the other way, but baptism is not in that context of John 3. It just ain't in there. You might as well face it. It ain't there. He said you've got to be born once. So you, He said that was uh, born of the flesh, first birth, is flesh, water. That was born of the spirit, second birth, is spirit. You can't beat that thing with a stick, brother. He said, Nick, you was born the first time of water. you got to be born the second time of the Holy Spirit. And Nicodemus said, I ain't never heard nothing like that, but I believe he got it. Well, let me move on right quickly. Night number four, he was a preacher who always preached the right message. Boy, I'd like to be like that, wouldn't you? There's been a lot of times when I got through preaching that I said, Oh, Lord, I blew it, I blew it, I made a mess. God, help me, God. I, maybe I said things I shouldn't have said, or maybe, God, I, I failed you. Lord, I'm ashamed, I'm sorry. But here's a preacher who never or never messed up. He always preached the right message. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he preached that great sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He was preaching the King to the Kingdom. Everything you find in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 doctrinally will apply to the King to unto His Kingdom. He is going to set up the King. He said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for there is a Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom, the Kingdom, the Kingdom, the Kingdom, them the kingdom. All right, then I treat was crucified, you know, and rose from the dead and went back to heaven. Paul got saved. Gentiles started getting saved, and he started preaching salvation by the grace of God. But here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's the king to the kingdom. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He had the right message. And not only that, I heard a guy on the radio this evening, and he had took a scripture out of Matthew 25, and he had it all backwards, boy. I mean, it's good preaching, but it was just you know, no, all of it was wrong. I enjoyed it because of the way he said it. But what he said was wrong. And the Lord never did that. He always had the right sermon. In Matthew 23, he burnt high, boy. I mean, you think he didn't preach hard? You read Matthew 23. He preached the hardest sermon I reckon it's ever been preached when he said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you bunch of hypocrites, you bunch of snakes. Why, you low down sorry, good for nothing. He said, you... Uh, Make the you garnish the sepulchers, and your fathers killed them to a tomb. He said, "You you worship the the ground them saints walked on, and your fathers killed them. And if you'd have been living, you'd have killed them. You don't have no respect for God. You don't have no respect for the Bible. You don't believe in me. You're a snake in the grass. You're just an old hypocrite." I tell you, he preached a sermon, and then in Matthew 24, he preached a great message about the last days in the tribulation, where there'll be war. 
wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and the abomination of desolation. As you, we studied that in the preacher's meeting the other night. How that, and what happens in the middle of the tribulation. How that the devil in the flesh, in the Antichrist, and all of that stuff, he preached it to them in Matthew 24. He, we ain't got time to talk about that, but he was a preacher who always preached the right message. But not only that, number, number five, he was a musician who never missed a note. I tell you, brother, he gave the birds their song. And the birds sang that song and never get out of tune. He gave the trees and let the wind blow through the trees. And the tree says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you ever heard the wind blowing through a bunch of trees? It sounds like Jesus. It really does. I mean, when they're blowing through that, it sounds like I said, Jesus. Jesus. I tell you, brother, they're talking about Jesus. And he gave them the song. He gave them the river. When the river runs across over them waterfalls, it's saying there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. When the frogs holler around the pond. We got a fish pond down below the house and it won't be long. We're already hearing them little ones go beep, 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 beep. And them little tiny peep frogs. But it won't be long till the big bass section will come out. And they'll say, You know what they're saying? There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing it. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest thing on the <laughs> But I believe they're singing about Jesus, don't you? Amen! I believe all creation groans and travail when a squirrel gets up in a tree and barks. I believe they're saying, Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hey! I tell you, brother, I believe that all creation is singing a song, and I'm here to tell you, he's a musician that never missed a note. Where's Teddy when you need him? I'm glad I'm not saying it tonight. Ain't you? I'm glad I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven. I'm just an old saved sinner. Don't know much, can't do much. But I'm saved on my way to glory. I just want to brag on Him and save me tonight. Not only that, right quick. i got to get off of that. He's an artist that never missed a stroke. I tell you, they got old rim ranting, all them famous painters in this day. And if you could talk to the man that painted the Mona Lisa, brother, he'd point you and say, right there, see that little bitty speck right there? I messed up. That ruined the whole thing. But I'm glad tonight the Lord is an artist who never missed a stroke. You ever seen the blend of colors he painted? Have you ever been to Limbo Caverns? Have you ever been to uh, SeaWorld down there in Disney World? I mean, they got fish, brother, just Thousands of different colors. Lord, Lord took every one of them little fish and said, Now I'm going to paint a black dot around his eye. And I'm going to leave him gold. And I'm going to paint his tail black and a blue stripe right around here. He just painted up every one of them fish. Some of them people never even seen on it over in Africa and down in the Amazon, South America. You think about that. That's an artist, brother. Wonder why the Lord done that. Wonder why the Lord didn't just make trees just stay green all year round. Or just pop out green and stay green then fall off. Wonder why He let them start changing and turn yellow then orange and red. You ever seen a maple tree in the fall? Son, ain't no artist can paint that. You got out here, you just got bright gold. Right inside that orange. Right inside that red. Right inside that green. Up here behind it's a blue sky. There ain't no artist can reproduce that. You can take that thing, you can take a 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, and you just can't get it, brother. He's an artist that never missed a stroke. I don't know why the Lord done all this. I guess just for us to enjoy. Appreciate that, Lord. 
Let us see all them pretty colors. I think really that the Lord let them things change colors to show us our light. You're green and young and strong. And then as you begin to get older, you mellow. And then you get brown. Fall off. You die. Is Linda Houck here tonight? Oh, you should have heard. You should have heard. Until we told her a few years ago, she, <laughs> she didn't know trees got little bitty leaves on them and buds and then grew. She thought leaves just popped out on trees. Or something like that. I remember her and Linda arguing and arguing about that. And the Lord don't do it like the Lord just let them start out little buds. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Turn brown, fall off. Not only that, I'm going to say this and I'm through tonight. He's a Savior who never fails to save. Hebrews 7.25 said he's able to save to the uttermost. All that come, they're no wise cast out. They ain't no cases too hard. They ain't no drunk too drunk. They ain't no drug addict too strung out for the Lord to save. He's a Savior who never fails to save. The Bible says that He's able to save to the uttermost. From the guttermost to the uttermost, as the old song says, or the old saying says, He took me out of the mire and put me in the choir. The old song said, Christ receiveth sinful men. He can save sinners, anyone. Doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. He can save, and He alone. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, Christ receiveth sinful men. He receiveth sinful men. I tell you, Brother old Henry Ward Beecher said, If Christ be not divine, every impulse of the Christian world falls uh, short, and light and love and hope decline. I remember one time this little girl, her daddy had left her at home, and he gave her a mouth, and he gave her a mouth that said, God, it's a... At some uh, missionary meeting or something like that. And anyway, it was a map of the world. And had all the countries in the world. And had them apart on those little pieces of that map. And he told her, he said, now honey. She wasn't about three years old. He said, now honey, you see if you can put that map together. He knew she couldn't do it. And boy, he said he went away. And he come back about two hours later. And he come back and lo and behold, that little girl had every country right in place. She had the United States, Africa, Asia, China, Russia, everything right in place. He said, how in the world...